Hello everyone, I'm Mr. Furlong, and today we're going to take a look at reading cladograms. We're going to be seeing a lot of these cladograms in class over the next few weeks, and so we want to talk a little bit about what they are. A cladogram is a diagram that shows relationships between different species. Here's an example of a fairly simple cladogram. And you can see that we have a group of animals that, one thing that they all have in common is that they are all invertebrates. But notice, off of this main line, we have these different branches. There are some going to a worm, there's going to a spider, there we see going to a couple different insects, and so on. Within each branch, we see different characteristics that we can use to show degrees of relatedness. So for instance, the butterfly and the dragonfly are two closely related species in this cladogram. More closely related, say, than the spider is to the butterfly. So if I wanted to say what other animal is most closely related to the ant, we would say it's the aphid here. That's one of the nice things about these cladograms is it can show us these relationships between different species. Now there are different types of cladograms that you might potentially see. Here's an example of one using primates. So again, if we were to say what group is most closely related to the humans, at least on this cladogram, we would say it's the apes of all of the different primates that we see here. Cladograms can get very complex though. Here's another example of a cladogram. We're going to be seeing something like this in a lab that we're going to be doing a little bit later on. But again, it can show us degrees of relatedness. So for instance, if I were to take a look at the squirrel, for instance, I would see that the guinea pig is the most closely related species on this list. How do these branches come about on cladograms? Well, we use something called a derived characteristic to make these branches or these clads. Each branch off of the trunk is called a clade. And so that's how we get the, the word the, the cladograms from. But how do we come up with these different branches or these different clades? Well, again, we have to take a look at these derived characteristics. How do we get these derived characteristics? Well, we use homologies. We talked about these in another video. Homologies are similarities in different species. In particular, there's two homologies that are used. One are called structural homologies. And this is where scientists will look at similar anatomical structures. And this is really the only way we can use to classify fossils because that's all we have left of them are the anatomical structures. But for living organisms, not only can we use the structural homologies, but we can also use biochemical homologies as well. Here we can compare the DNA sequences between species to see how closely related they are to one another. And based on their DNA, this can then tell us what species are more closely related, but also how long ago did a common ancestor live. So that's the other thing that cladograms can tell us. Let's take a look at an example of how cladograms have changed because of these homologies. First of all, here we see a picture of a polar bear. Polar bears, based on their DNA, had evolved from the grizzly bear. Remember, in a previous video, we talked about ecological isolation that would have caused this. Another type of bear that you're familiar with, though, is the giant panda bear. And oftentimes when we think of panda bears, this is what we think of, but there's other types of pandas. For instance, there is the red panda as well. And so when we were using structural homologies to classify these, the cladogram would have looked something like this, where all of these bears would have had a common ancestor at some point. Now granted, all mammals would have had a common ancestor earlier on. And that the polar bear and the grizzly bear, uh, they are a very recent offshoot of one another. And so we see that uh, time-wise, their common ancestor didn't live that long ago compared to the common ancestor for all of these bears. And that at some point there would have been a common ancestor for the, our, these two types of pandas. But here's something interesting. When they took the DNA of the giant panda and compared it to the DNA of the red panda, they realized that the DNA really isn't all that closely related. And in fact, the red panda's DNA is more similar to the DNA of another animal. Can you see maybe what animal looks sort of like the red panda? Yeah, the raccoon, doesn't it? We see a lot of similarities between these two. 
Uh, they both have kind of a ring tail that almost kind of look like they have a mask on their face. And so because of this, the red panda has been removed from the bear group entirely, and a new cladogram was made. Now there's a common ancestor between these mammals, but the red panda is no longer with the bears. These bears all had a common ancestor at some point, but based on the DNA, we see that the red panda and the raccoon had a common ancestor that was coming off a whole different branch in their evolution. Now, why do we use these cladograms? Well, I'm sure you've seen a picture similar to this. And this is trying to show the evolution of humans. But what this picture really is doing, it makes us think that humans evolve from chimps. And that's not the case at all. This picture does not depict evolution at all. Let me give you another example. This is not your family tree. Your great-grandfather did not evolve into your grandfather. That evolved into your father. That evolved into you. It doesn't even make sense, right? I mean, that's what, but that's what that previous picture was trying to tell us. No, it doesn't work that way. Just like evolution doesn't work this way. It's not fish evolved into amphibians that evolved into mammals that eventually evolved into humans. That's not how it happened. In fact, this is more like what our family tree is. Now, you and your brothers and sisters all have a common ancestor. Those are your parents. You and your cousins all have a common ancestor. Those would be your grandparents. You and all your second cousins have a common ancestor. Those would be your great-grandparents and so on. This is more how a family tree is, which is also how evolution is. That there wasn't no direct evolution between a fish and a salamander and a cat and a, to us but that we did have some common ancestors. Yes, there was a common ancestor for all of the mammals today. And yes, there is a common ancestor for all vertebrate animals that have four legs. And yes, there is a common ancestor for all animals that have a vertebrae or have a backbone. Now, do we only use DNA or do we only use structural homologies? No, there's a variety of things that we can use to classify organisms to make these cladograms. We can look at those similar anatomical structures, certainly, but we can take a look at what are the functions of those anatomical structures. We can look at what sort of behaviors do they have. You know, if you've ever watched any of those videos of, of lions and they're grooming themselves, looks a lot like a cat. And because of this, they're grouped into some of the same categories. Uh, it could be their embryonic development. All of these are called homologies, and any and all of these things can be used in the making of a cladogram. So we're going to be practicing making these cladograms in class. We're going to look at how to read them, and eventually we're going to be looking at some real DNA to help us classify some species. So I'm really looking forward to that, and I'll see you in class.